Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Welcome to another episode of the Sweet Nothings podcast. It is a delight to have you here. If you didn't know already, this is your home of relaxed, funny and informative chats all about the love of eating. We'll talk about the latest food trends, some controversial opinions and all things edible. We're coming back from a little bit of an unplanned summer break thanks to a little bit of budget holidaying and you know a little break from as much baking as usual because of the consistent over 30 degree temperatures. (laughs) But it is according to the calendar somehow already autumn and I am back to share my thoughts and my love of food and all of the car crash news and trends we have had related to it, even in the little amount of time that I've been away. (laughs) So we're going to have a little bit of a catch up of everything we have not spoken about yet from the end of summer 2022 in terms of food. And then we're going to get stuck into the most famous and controversial seasonal drink that even after all these years, I haven't quite wrapped my head around. And I don't know if you will have either. (laughs) I feel, I feel like it is impossible to touch upon any of this summer's food trends, food news, food opinions without talking about pink sauce. As always, this insanely vital, in more ways than one, food trend comes to us from the depths of TikTok. Even if you're not on TikTok, you may have heard about this new product slash phenomenon slash disaster. (laughs) At some point, I believe back in July, a creator who calls herself Chef P or Chef Pi, I'm not sure, created what she called and still calls pink sauce. Now, there have been numerous videos all across TikTok of her creating and eating this pink sauce, people recreating it, people buying it from her. And in a very, very short span of time afterwards, some of the biggest creators on the internet deep diving into the dark side of this product, the alleged health claims, the alleged incorrect labeling, and all of the kind of fallout that came from that. (laughs) To catch you up very, very quickly, just because it is absolutely worth spending 10 to 15 minutes of your day doing a full-on dunk into everything that has happened with this in such a short space of time. But the pink sauce was essentially kind of brought to everyone's attention because of its color. Now, I'm not talking pink like Marie Rose. You know, I'm not talking prawn cocktail pink. I'm not talking salsa rosa pink. I'm not even talking tara masalata pink. I am talking... (laughs) I am talking like Barbie's Jeep pink, the Barbie Dreamhouse pink, Bratz lipstick hot pink, like the hottest of hot pinks you have ever seen, or at least it was initially. And this is kind of what brought everyone's attention to this incredibly viral video and viral product. The creator made this and she was eating it with everything from kind of fried chicken to chicken wings to tacos. And of course it was capturing attention because It was an incredible and incredibly appealing color. There aren't many foods other than the very occasional tropical fruit that, you know, are this color naturally. So people were by nature asking just what, you know, what, what, what pink hell was contained inside it? Did did it taste any good? What did it taste like? How was it made? And more importantly, could they buy it? And the creator quickly saw a gap in the market, a lucrative opportunity, which absolutely fair play to her. And she began creating big batches and shipping this pink sauce. And this is essentially where the alleged disasters began. Everything from alleged mistakes in the ingredients list, alleged mistakes in the nutritional information, alleged mistakes in the amount of servings contained within a bottle, to alleged problems with shipping, alleged problems with products that should really have been refrigerated not being refrigerated and further down the line alleged bad reactions to consuming the stuff when it hadn't been properly stored allegedly the whole thing has taken tiktok twitter youtube everything by storm it's slightly old news by now but if it's something you haven't read or watched anything about, it is genuinely worth a few minutes of your time because I got fully caught up this week after, you know, trying to give my already smooth brain a break from social media for a little while. 
<laughs> but yes, pink sauce has been the absolute biggest trend for better or for worse this summer. Something that also violently grabbed my attention this summer thanks to, I believe, some kind of, I don't know whether you can call it an exhibition or what you would call it, that was held between kind of, I believe, the beginning of July all the way up to the end of August concerning some of the most insane ice cream flavors that have ever existed. Now, I don't mean just, you know, silly little flavor combinations. I mean unhinged. I mean check the hard drive. <laughs> to catch you up, I am talking about the Anya Hindmarch ice cream product based in London. Being served in a kind of very Instagrammable concept store from the 9th of July to the 25th of August this year, Anya Hindmarch, a kind of designer, artist, etc, etc, was serving up a collection of unexpected and delicious ice creams and sorbets celebrating her favourite cult food brands. Now, Anya Hindmarch is, as I say, you know, a designer known for various things, been around, I believe, since the late 80s in London, creating creating things that, you know, have, have been created. For example, on sale on her website right now, just for a little bit of reference as to the kind of products we're talking about, a sequin Heinz tomato ketchup branded tote handbag for a very, very meagre £895 sterling. For international listeners, that is, you know, probably equivalent to over a thousand euros or over a thousand US dollars for a sequined ketchup branded tote bag, just to give you a little bit of context about the kind of thing we're talking about here. Now, these things were all over Instagram, they were all over Twitter, mostly because of the flavours and everything to do with the catastrophic combination of flavours involved in these. Though the tubs look cool, though the ice cream itself is fascinating in the most horrendous way, essentially Anya Hindmarch was combining some of the biggest kind of names in British food with ice cream. Now, I'm not talking about things like a Cadbury Dairy Milk ice cream or, you know, even like a, a slightly more exciting, I don't know, Toblerone ice cream. No, we're talking about things like Heinz Salad Cream ice cream, tomato ketchup ice cream, soy sauce ice cream. Let me just read to you some of the copy from the Anya Hindmarch website, trying to describe to you what the experience of eating some of these ice creams is like. And honestly, some of them do intrigue me. For example, there is a Lyle's Golden Syrup ice cream. There is a Kellogg's Frosties ice cream. Incredibly reasonable. But there's also a Worcester sauce ice cream. <laughs> Let me read some of these descriptions to you because I very much enjoyed them while reading up for this episode this morning. An example, the Kikoman soy sauce ice cream, a delicious toasted sesame ice cream laced with umami rich naturally brewed soy sauce. Now someone, someone, someone's job was to write copy for that to make it sound appealing. And by God, they've tried, you know, but they haven't quite nailed it. We move on to uh, an even more horrifying example, the Heinz mayonnaise ice cream, a surprising rich and creamy ice cream with the zestiness of lemon and tang of vinegar. Again, a solid attempt. Does it compare to the grim description of the Heinz baked beans ice cream, a rich sweet flavoured ice cream brimming with protein, one of your five a day? Is that a joke or a threat? We'll never know. And finally, the the one that the one that really is making me shudder the most, to be honest, the Lee and Perrin's Worcester sauce ice cream, <laughs> a sweet tomato fruit sorbet. It could have stopped there, but it somehow gets worse with a splash of Worcester sauce, almost like a savory, <laughs> a sweet and savory Bloody Mary ice cream without the booze or any of the fun that comes with, you know, I guess drinking a Bloody Mary. I've never consumed one by choice. Again, you have to respect the <laughs> the innovation that the free market of cap capitalism allows for, but um, 
you know, I'll leave you to be the judge of whether this kind of flavor would catch on or whether we never need to see a similar exhibition ever again. And the final kind of controversial food industry news that has been popping up as of July and August of this year has been the new collaboration between Ben and Jerry's and Tony's Chocolate Only, something that people are equally excited by and really fed up with. So, Ben and Jerry's world famous American ice cream brand, Tony's Chocolate Only, an iconic Dutch chocolate company, both of which on the surface are very righteous, very progressive, very representative of political, sociological and environmental problems going on in the world at the moment, right? And both creating some tasty products. Tony's have some great affordable milk chocolate. Ben and Jerry's have some decent quality ice cream. However, though they have created some Ben and Jerry's inspired Tony's bars, one with brownies and one with strawberry cheesecake, and some Tony's inspired Ben and Jerry's ice cream, salted caramel swirls, caramel chunks, sea salt chocolatey chunks. Of course it sounds delicious, but there has been about an equal amount of controversy as to the kind of legitimacy of the background to this collaboration. So while both brands might be favourites in your household or favourites you know, that you've tried, you might have enjoyed the products before and think this is two, you know, reputable and famous brands coming together to make a tasty product. They're calling it the chocolate love affair. A social mission that covers human rights and dignity, social and economic justice and environmental protection, restoration and regeneration. Some of the kind of issues or at least the eyebrows that have been raised around this collaboration, for example, though, are Ben & Jerry's is owned by a multi-billion dollar international company. You know, is that the best starting ground for talking about social and economic justice? And Tony's Chocolate Only have in past, not from the beginning, but have allegedly been linked to Barry Calabau, who allegedly have some less than ethical practices in some of their cocoa farming. Is this the best foundation for human rights and dignity conversations on a global stage? I'll leave you guys to be the judge of that. I imagine the products will be delicious. If I'm back in the UK while they're still available, I probably will try them. But you can see, especially in the ever fatigued world that we live in just now, how Things like this can seem a little bit like cashing in on problems that could allegedly have been created by the people that are actually cashing in on them. But let's move on. Ever thought about starting your own podcast? Let me tell you about Buzzsprout. Buzzsprout is the easiest, the easiest and best way to launch, promote and track your podcast and everything about it. Just record your audio and Buzzsprout will help you do all the rest. Your voice can be on Apple Podcasts, Spotify and other platforms in literally just a few minutes. I've been using Buzzsprout ever since starting the Sweet Nothings podcast and have never even considered working with any other podcast hosts since. If you want to try podcasting for yourself, just check out the affiliate link in the show notes or the description to get started. So that is about it for the kind of dominant, um, controversial and car crash food trends and food news over the summer. September so far has been blissfully quiet, but I imagine a month from now within when we drop the next episode, that could all have changed. <laughs> but today I want to talk about something that came to mind a couple of weeks ago when I brought it up in conversation here in Italy and something that's on everyone's mind and you know everyone's Instagram, Pinterest feeds, whatever, as soon as autumn hits. I'm talking about pumpkin spice everything. Just what is it about pumpkin spice? We're going to take a look into this season's most fashionable beverage that somehow, you know, all these years still is and just what makes it and its flavour so weirdly irresistible. But what are we talking about here? The origin of the whole pumpkin spice phenomenon is the component parts of a large orange vegetable. 
being combined with refined cane sugar syrup and a selection of toasted ground spices. But that doesn't sound particularly photography friendly. <laughs> I imagine that pumpkin pie, you know, the kind of iconic American movie dessert dating back over a hundred years, which is, you know, a very big tradition around fall time around Thanksgiving and even also all the way up to Christmas, I believe, this is probably where the inspiration from adding pumpkin spice to other foods and just other objects nowadays has probably come from. Pumpkin pie itself is, of course, absolutely delicious. And it typically contains, you know, actual pumpkin puree, typically from a can, with a blend of spices like cinnamon, nutmeg, ginger, cloves, sometimes even more. Around 2004, before the days of the reusable coffee cup and then back to the non-reusable coffee cups and then back to reusable coffee cups again that we're in now, (laughs) Starbucks introduced their pumpkin spice latte in the US. And due to its uniqueness at the time, much like many of other, you know, Starbucks drinks, at the time, almost 20 years ago, unbelievably, and how, of course, twee and charmingly seasonal the drink was, it has, it, you know, it exploded in popularity. It was, it was, a, it was a must-have, or at least a must-try. Now, apparently and interestingly, in the first few years of its existence, the pumpkin spice latte didn't actually contain any real pumpkin. I wasn't there in the US to try it at the time, but apparently that is the case. Only in recent years has actual pumpkin puree, or in the case of the United Kingdom version, where I am, pumpkin juice, much to the delight of fellow, you know, young millennials and Harry Potter lovers. (laughs) Pumpkin puree has only recently been added to the roster of ingredients. Um, The addition of an actual vegetable being put into coffee didn't put people off, and you know, didn't take away from the kind of wholesome sound of a drink while adding an actual vegetable flavour. And every single year since, basically, not even as soon as autumn hits officially, not as soon as the leaves start turning brown, not as soon as you're pulling out your cardigans and your thicker denier tights, just basically as soon as the 31st of August (laughs) at midnight hits, Starbucks are on it. They are there and they want you to drink pumpkin spice everything. And it's not just them anymore. It's, 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 it's like everyone, every, everyone that has any kind of food to promote or items to promote, even now, again, when we're so fatigued with stuff and the cost of everything, this stuff is still on sale every single year. And, you know, Putting vegetables into a dessert made sense back in the day, back when we had rationing, you know, and back when things were even more expensive than they are now or more unavailable than they are now. When Brits were putting carrots into cake, Americans were putting pumpkins into pie. Turning a vegetable-based dessert that was already a bit strange into a hot drink and now, of course, an iced version of the hot drink is, is even more odd. And we have taken this oddity and made it even odder. Um, (laughs) The reason I want to talk about it today is after a recent conversation I had with an incredibly confused and befuddled chef friend here in Italy. Is it actually that good? Is this world, is this, you know, iconic drink in the US and the UK, is it actually that good? Is it good enough to warrant the hype that it gets every single year? Flavor-wise, honestly, I think it's quite hard to tell. (laughs) The person I was talking to here doesn't, you know, he doesn't speak English. He's never traveled to an English-speaking country, for example. He's never been to the United Kingdom. He's never been to the US. So it's understandable he's never heard of this atrocity as some might call it. And Starbucks, the reason we were having this conversation, only has, I believe, about 15 locations across Italy where I now live. About 10 of which are in Milan, in the northwest of Italy, one of the most international cities, and the others are scattered throughout airports and shopping centres across the country. It hasn't taken off. It really hasn't taken off. And it doesn't surprise me. Italians are very stubborn in particular with how, when, and why they like to drink their coffee. And Starbucks doesn't really fit, even with the amount of tourists that flock 
to and from Italy every single year, it still doesn't really hit here like it hits in other places. So I was trying to describe, you know, what some of the Starbucks drinks are like to this friend and specifically (laughs) the pumpkin spice latte and its ingredients. And his response, aside from a double raised eyebrow, (laughs) perhaps understandably was a kiss kifo to translate how disgusting. Um, you know, it, it's a bright, it's a bright orange drink. And even with the presence of espresso, the espresso that Starbucks pride themselves on, and milk, whether it's soy milk, oat milk, cow's milk, if anyone's still drinking that from Starbucks these days, it's, 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 it's a strange colour. It's a strange colour. It's not really brown. It's not really you know, creamy. It's just orange. It looks like carrot and coriander soup that was thinned out too much. It's obviously laced with sugar, filling every single crevice of your mouth with undeniable and aggressive sweetness. The spices, noticeably cinnamony and gingery, don't actually blend particularly well with the flavour of the coffee that they share the cup with, um, which is a shame because they could but they don't. <laughs> and somehow every single year we lap up this com- this combination or, you know, at the very least the idea and the what it represents. And we want to add its flavor and its scent to just about everything that we can lay our hands on. And for example, if you're outside of the UK and you're listening and you're wondering, Kelly, what on earth are you talking about? For video viewers, I do apologise, my hair keeps getting caught in my glasses today and I've probably hauled it out of them four times already on camera today. (laughs) In the UK, just from memory, we have seen cakes become pumpkin spice inspired. And not just in Starbucks, but in the other big kind of iconic coffee chains and in local cake shops, anything. We've also seen nut butters have this flavour Body lotion have this flavour. Candles have this scent and flavour. All getting the pumpkin spice or even the full pumpkin spice latte makeover over the years. That combination of, you know, autumn squash with some spices and some coffee, which sounds horrendous out of context. (laughs) And that's without mentioning the fact that, again, just from memory and from what I've seen over the years, the fact that the United States has gone as far as selling breakfast cereals, pasta sauces, and even cough drops, like throat sweets, all inspired by this aggressive orange phenomenon. (laughs) And upon taking my first taste of the last pumpkin spice latte I had last autumn, it reminded me that it's not even one of my favourite drinks, even as someone with a real insatiable sweet tooth, and it's not even close. But that said, you can't help yourself sometimes from from wanting one, from caving to the advertising, from thinking you want to give it another go, whether it's the iced version, the blonde roast version, the classic version, just with more cream on top. And ridiculously, I know fine well, personally, that I would prefer a hot chocolate or a cup of tea, but sometimes you're just brought in. And I am a cynic at the best of times, as anyone who listens to this podcast will know, but there's something about this trend that me and so many others, especially food bloggers, it has us in a chokehold. We can't seem to shake it off as soon as, you know, the first couple of weeks of September are here. But why? This this is what I'm coming to you with today. I want to know why. I would love to know what you think, your opinions on the drink, your opinions on the flavor in general, your opinions on the vibe and, you know, the whole, the whole iconic state of pumpkin spice everything. Why? Is it because we're all kind of longing for something to fill the gap between the misery of the end of summer and the kind of twee cuteness of Halloween and stuff? You know, we in the UK don't have Thanksgiving to look forward to, for example. So often once August finishes, it just feels like you're rattling towards Christmas despite what your bank account and your, you know, your common sense is telling you. (laughs) Undoubtedly, you know, the, the obsession with pumpkin spice lattes and pumpkin spice everything in the UK 
has to be linked to our obsession, our remaining obsession with American culture. You know, it's depleting a little bit these days, I have to be honest. You know, I don't think British teens have the same dreamy fascination with American culture that teenagers did and kids did when I was younger. But, you know, we still have an excess of um, of United States shows and movies on Netflix, US personalities all over social media and ever, ever increasing still US culture being reflected in our own food industry. And it means it, it must only have been a matter of time before pumpkin spice hype and pumpkin spice everything appeared, you know. Just think of the influence, for example, over the last 10 to 15 years of McDonald's, of Reese's Peanut Butter Cups and Krispy Kreme Donuts. The United Kingdom version of Pumpkin Spice and the Pumpkin Spice Latte and all of its spin-offs have become like as prominent a thing in the UK as they have been in the United States, despite the fact they've had it for almost 20 years. And I wonder if it's the novelty of it every single year that pulls us in. Like the novelty of Cadbury's mini eggs. You know, are they the best thing? I don't know. But do they keep us coming back? And what is it that keeps us coming back? Is that what it is? Is it something that kind of symbolizes the change of seasons more obviously or more quickly than other things do? You know, Is it the thought of returning to school or to university or to work after a a little summer break that makes us feel a bit gloomy and that, you know, this sort of marker of change is what we crave? Pumpkin spice blank, pumpkin spice everything could offer just that if you're as easily entertained as me and some others are. (laughs) But what is it? What, what is it that doesn't make us do that with other kind of seasonal foods? Why don't we celebrate apples? Why don't we celebrate pears in the same way? Is it because they're cheaper? Is it because they're boring? Is it because they're even more widely available year round nowadays so it's not quite as exciting or a symbol of status that Starbucks still can be despite the fact it's so commonplace now? You know, in the UK we're suckers for anything limited edition even if the word limited is becoming less and less significant every single year. <laughs> you know, you cast your eye to, for example, the the early January stock of chocolate Easter eggs, whether it's the little individual ones or the actual, you know, Easter specific bigger ones, the big brand name ones. We used to see them from maybe March onwards, but now you can literally see them as soon as the Christmas period is over. Like first week of January, just when people are about to go on their, you know, their diets or their New Year's resolutions, you're already seeing Easter chocolate. And also these days, the September stock of of Christmas chocolate or Christmas food products, for example. If we can stick it on social media, even when we're all fatigued with social media these days too, like it's, it's even better. It's like the September, October version of the summer out of office tweet or the compulsory summer social media story of drinking a pint at eight o'clock in the morning in a really, really overpriced airport pub. (laughs) And perhaps you're listening to this thinking, I literally have no idea what you're talking about. But if, if you're someone who spends even a couple of hours on social media each week, I'm sure you've seen what I'm talking about, even if you're not quite as wrapped up in all things food as as my feeds are, you know? Or perhaps you think, you know, you think very little of it. It's just another tradition. It's just another little seasonal tradition because new traditions do have to be made. And, you know, we might think that we're, you know, so contemporary and modern and fast moving nowadays, but the UK particularly is so like absolutely shackled to tradition still for better or worse that we may as well still be sending kids up chimneys. You know what I mean? It's... (laughs) You know, take some of our other kind of festive seasons traditions, for example. As much as I hate to be bringing it up on the first week of September, but Christmas pudding. It's not the best pudding in the world. It's not the prettiest pudding in the world. It's not even easy to make. And yet so many hundreds or even thousands of us eat it on Christmas Day every single year. Why? Why? (laughs) We love tradition. 
just as much as we love other kind of lovely and lowly pastimes, even if we all like to try and rise above it and pretend that we're somehow superior, you know, we drink our coffee black or we, we buy cinnamon or apple scented candles instead of the pumpkin spice ones. But this is exactly what I want to ask you guys your opinion for. Let me know on social media. If you're watching this episode on YouTube, drop me a comment because I, I would love to know your thoughts. Is it just that this is a new tradition? Is it marketing gone absolutely haywire and now we all just lap it up or is it actually that good or is it not even as much of a phenomenon as it seems to be and it's only certain people that seem to be targeted with it i.e me (laughs) is it something to add to our personalities you know or are we trying to be even more of a personality by being edgy and rejecting it or you know should we just let ourselves enjoy it lap up the kind of the adorable tackiness of it all and just appreciate that some change from sticky humid heat is coming. I don't know. But every single year I find myself asking this question specifically about all things pumpkin spice. Is it even that nice? Why do we still have it? And who is keeping it alive? Because some of you must be buying it. I know I am. At least once every two years. (laughs) even if I'm not able to get my hands on it this year. But it has been very fascinating to hear, for example, uh, a Southern European perspective on something that I thought was more international and global than it is. And I would love to hear your thoughts. I know that we have listeners from all over the world. I know some of you are based in the US, so you'll have been subjected to even more advertising about this than I have. I know many of you are in the UK, but wherever you are, I would love to know your thoughts. What, what is it? What is it about pumpkin spice? But as always, if you are still here through whatever this episode was, thank you so, so much for listening. I hope you found it, you know, well, you definitely haven't found it informative, but I hope you found it at least somewhat calm, comforting, entertaining, thought provoking, or even just a good waste of about 30 to 40 minutes of your time. As we are getting back on track with the podcast production and with content creation, I will be back with another episode for you guys next month in October. And in the meantime, as always, you can find me overly active at Maverick Baking on YouTube, Maverick Baking on TikTok, Maverick Baking on Instagram, of course, maverickbaking.com, where I am always sharing recipes from all kinds of backgrounds and inspirations. And it would be lovely to see you again. Thank you as always for listening and I'll catch you for the next one. You're listening to the Sweet Nothings podcast. If you want to support the production, get access to exclusive foodie content and early access to podcast episodes, you can do so via Patreon. Just search for Sweet Nothings or Maverick Baking on Patreon and thank you for everything.